Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you to the National Conference on Economic Development of Assam in the context of Northeast Juxtaposition and Locus Policy, organized by Krishna Kanto Handik State Open University. Assam and the other Northeastern states are rich in natural resources, biodiversity, and multi ethnic cultures. In spite of this, however, the region is lagging far behind in economic and social cultural development compared to other states of the country. The conference will address the issue of how the recent policy framework of the UNIT government has affected the investment climate of the region, how has the locust policy affected the economies of the states, how can the burning problem of flood and erosion be solved, etc. We hope this conference will evoke and provoke further thought, research, and critiques. We now begin this auspicious occasion with the Saraswati Vandana to be performed by Queen Sharma. She will be accompanied on the guitar by John Das, the tabla by Papu Harma, and the flute by Rupen Rasbongi. <laughs>
The inaugurator of this conference, Dr. Otul Harma, former director, Indian Statistical Institute, Delhi, former vice chancellor, Rajiv Gandhi University, Arunachal Pradesh, and member, 13th Finance Commission. The chief guest, Sri H. M. Das, noted economist and former chief secretary, Assam, former chairman, Administrative Reform Commission and Assam Finance Commission. The guests of honor, Sri Modern Prasad Bezbura, former Union Secretary, Ministry of Tourism, Government of India, and former Advisor, Planning Commission. Professor Khurshid Alam, former Professor of Economics and Dean, Faculty of Arts, Kohati University. And Dr. Jitendralal Borkakoti, former Professor of Economics, Hertfordshire University, UK, will now kindly take their place on the dais. I would now request Sri Bhaskar Sarma, the convener of this national conference, to felicitate Dr. Otul Harma. I now request Mitish Mita Kashyap to felicitate Sri Madhul Prasad Pais Burwa. <laughs> Professor Khushal Alam has not arrived here. He'll join us shortly. Chayanika Sanapati will now felicitate Dr. Jitendra Lal Borkakuti. I would like to request Dr. Indrani Dekha to felicitate the Honorable Vice Chancellor of KP Handy State Open University, Professor Srinath Borua. May I now request Dr. Otto Harma and other dignitaries on the dais to come forward and light the ceremonial lamp. May I request Antara Mohanto to felicitate Professor Khurshid Alam. The welcome address will now be delivered by the Vice Chancellor of KK Handy State Open University, Professor Srinath Bora. Inaugurator of this national conference, Professor Abdul Prama, CPS, Anandana Das, guest of honor, Sri Manon Prasadya Gurula, Dr. Jitendra Lal Prakapati, and Professor Kuchi Lalon, and invited guests and the delegates of this conference. I am very happy to welcome all of you to this inaugural function of this National Conference on Economic Development of Assam. The idea for holding this conference came to our mind when I met Dr. Borkakuti about one and a half years back. And he suggested that there are many issues, burning issues of the northeastern region in general and Assam in particular, which can be widely discussed through a conference on economic development. And then, so the senior citizens of this city, particularly the former judge of the Supreme Court, came Saikya and some others, we met in our university and then we decided last year that we will hold a conference on that. And accordingly we proceeded and finally with their support from, finally the support from some of the organizations like BRPL, Oil India Limited, Distance Education Council, and State Bank of India, Northeastern Council we could be able to organize this conference. So this is a three-day conference, and tomorrow and day after tomorrow will be the main technical sessions to be held in another venue. We all know that 
this particular region of this country in spite of base effort by the central government in spite of base effort made by the state government we find that the development is lagging far behind there are many regions which i am not discussing here in this welcome address so our guest from new delhi as well as our chief guest will give a brief idea about that particular issue what i want to briefly tell that we are taking up for discussion in the two days technical sessions a variety issues like the fund flow to this region it it is utilization and the problem of governance then we'll discuss some burning issues like flood and erosion then the prospect of tourism then the challenges and opportunities of tea industry hydrocarbon industry so these are some of the issues and also we plan to discuss some important issues relating to the social sector like health education and human resource development so these issues will be dealt with in detail so that whatever the low faults of the existing policies of the government not only the state government of assam the other parts of this region what are the policy we are adopting as a north eastern region in comprehensively that those policies will be discussed and we will try to put forward some suggestions for implementation so with this view this uh, conference has been organized and before i conclude my welcome address i i would like to tell the august gathering that this is a very new university it was established in 2006 only and we started our academic program in the jan month of january of 2008 and in the last two years the university has been able to progress both vertical expansion as well as horizontal expansion with the support of the academics particularly from guwahati university from dibrugarh university and also some academics from outside the state and at the moment the university is running about 42 programs academic programs and mostly we are giving due emphasis on the vocational and professional courses so that those unemployed persons with less educational level lower educational level can be employed in a gainful of employment opportunities and that is why this university is giving lot of emphasis on vocational and professional courses and we are doing it with the support from the various itis and polytechnics located in the various nook and corner states and at the moment the university has this year enroll about 40000 learners all over the state as well as we have certain learners from the state of tripura and nagaland now this is the progress we have made and recently i am very happy to announce here and many of you might have known it that the university for the first time in the whole of northeastern region we have launched a community radio educational radio we call it gyan taranga so in these words i welcome all the delegates i welcome all the guests here thank you thank you sir may i now request dr otul harma to give the inaugural speech uh, honorable vice chancellor dr sina purwa chief guest hn das in an formal union secretary madam desburwa professor barka koti and professor alam the respected delegates and ladies and gentlemen i feel indeed privileged to have been invited to inaugurate inaugurate this particular this very important seminar on a very relevant and topical subject economic development by sam i am grateful to the kk handik open university particularly to the sinan barua for having for inviting me to inaugurate this inaugurate it at this seminar this evening i already we are behind the schedule i don't take much time but i would like to i propose to share some reflections 
on one question. India is a developing country, we used to call it a backward country, comprising 28 states. But of these 28 states, some states have developed faster than others. The question is, why is it that some states could develop faster than others? That is what really my reflection is about. I thought this will be quite relevant in the context of this particular seminar, theme of the seminar. I have a hypothesis which I'd like to place before you. In economics, we have what we always talk about certain factors which contribute towards first the development of a state or a nation. One of them is resource base. If we talk about resource base, then Bihar, now Zarkhan, Uriska, Assam, these are all resourceful states, but yet they are not developed. Another factor we talk about that is closeness to the national market. UP is a UP, Rajasthan, and some of the states are very close to the national market, but yet they are not developed. If there is a very good come, uh, transport network that is advantageous for development, UP, Bihar has got very advantageous transport net network, but yet they are not developed. But in contrast, some of the states which have developed faster do not have any of those advantages. Let's take the case of Luzat, which really doesn't have much of resources. Now we have got, we have got some oil and all that. It's not very close to the national market. Not it has, it is centrally located, but yet it is one of the fastest growing states of the country. Similarly, Punjab and Haryana, Punjab of course is decelerating very fast now. But Punjab and Haryana grew faster, but they cannot claim to have, it's not really, they have got any irrigation as an endowment, but it was fertile land, but other than that, there's not much of resources. So, now that if this, that is this subject, this resource base, or national market by itself are not, they are necessary but they are not sufficient conditions for development. Then what explains development? My hypothesis is the states which have been able to articulate that development trust in a well-defined development perspective are the states which have developed faster than others. I'll give some examples. For example, Banzar has been able to develop two parts of that hypothesis. One is that they have to have well articulated trust areas in the development perspective. And second part is that this should be pursued over a longer period of time. The Punjab, for instance, have a development perspective where the agriculture would be the lead sector. And they have one step, and this step, this step identified as a trust area, and they have pursued as the policy goal over a long period of time. This can be said, Haryana has got twofold development trust to leverage on the closeness of the national capital and the agriculture and development. These are two prone strategies. <laughs> development trust and they have been pursuing over a long period of time. Kerala on the other end, they have identified social sector as the trust area in their development perspective. And 
goes that they have identified industrial development as the trust there. So now the question is, how does it work? There's two things that they identify the trust, well articulated that the development trust in a development perspective, and they pursue them over a long period of time. And all these states have done that. In the rest of many of the states, there are some of many of the states which have not really developed, they do not have that kind of well articulated trust area in a development perspective. Then the question is, how does it work? It works perhaps the following way. That when development trust are given and pursued over a long period of time, that actors at the grassroots level come to know that this is the policy of the government, and they start demanding the delivery of public services which are required to develop that particular, to work in that particular sector, for instance, agriculture. If the agriculture is a trust area, the farmers know the government has given farming, agriculture, the high priority in their development perspective. So farmers start demanding all that is required to be able to do their farming efficiently. As a result, there is a there is, there is a pressure from below for the delivery of public services efficiently. Just to illustrate, I will illustrate this point. You know, a long time ago, we would, I was traveling with, a, with the chief engineer area of irrigation, chief engineer irrigation in Hari, of Haryana. We went to a very remote part of the state to see one irrigation project. In no time, a large number of farmers came to meet the chief engineer. Chief engineer went and came back in a very, very short period of time. We asked the question that how is it that he didn't know they came so quickly, immediately after we came, this group of farmers came to see you. And second question is that how did you, how did you deal with these people so quickly? His answer was, so he said, his answer was, but the first question is easy because we have the booking in the <coughs> dark bungalow, so they know that we are becoming. And second question is that, you know, I asked the, asked the question, what is the problem? They said that the Nukobet irrigation canal does not give them adequate amount of water. And he, after he told that he would go back in 24 hours time, an engineer would come and will set it right. Then he explained, suppose I don't do it, it was, I'm talking about 84, 85 period. In those days, there was no mobile telephone or something, only communication was the wireless. And he was saying that suppose I don't do this. If I don't do this, then I will be, one of them would go to MLA or so somebody may go to the minister or chief minister and tell them that I have not addressed their problem. There's an understanding that as soon as if, if the minister calls them, immediately they will have to go back. So he thought that, he said that suppose I have, to, I don't do it, then I will ask to go to Chandigarh, leaving you here. And they will all give the instruction to set it right. So the, in that, so why should I take the trouble? Instead, let me address the problem straight away. This is how the pressure comes from below and the accountability comes in. So this is how that uh, if the trust areas are well, well articulated in a development perspective and pursuit over a period of time. Grassroots, the grassroot level actors come to know about it and they start demanding delivery of services as a result that there is an accountability. Which eventually means that better governance been ensured because of this. Coming to Northeast India, the question can be raised, do we have a development perspective 
And within the development state, have we been able to articulate some trust areas which, we could, which, have, which could be pursued over a period of time? In my view, that for Northeast India or for that matter Assam, there is no development perspective. In fact, Northeast India, because of its isolation, the problems are all well known. Eight, nine problems that hinder the economic development of the region, state or the region is well known. Infrastructure lack, population influx, governance, enclave economy. All these problems are quite well known. Well known. But development perspective was not developed. In fact, I believed the government of India, in, in, a, in a state, in a region like Northeast India, the role of public sector has to be much larger because the, the resource based, it has got resource based, but the tax base is very limited. And the private sector, private entrepreneurship is not there. And therefore, the government or public sector has to play a much larger role. But for public sector to perform a larger role, it has to have a development perspective. But development perspective was not there. It was, in fact, an entire approach to my mind, at the central government approach to the development of North India. Northeast India was anchored on two premises. One, that this region was viewed from the angle of security. Every policy that was big intervention was viewed from the angle of security. There's a security perspective, but not development perspective. And second, it was premised that in the, in the, in the hill, hill states, there should be least intervention in the economic and social systems. That was the policy Nehru developed for the Northeastern, but not hill states particularly, hill areas. So, if you look at the NEC, to my mind, when so many states were created out of former Assam, there was a great innovative administrative innovation in the in the form of Northeast Council. But unfortunately, and not for that administrative ministry of Northeast Council was not any economic development department or planning commission. It was the Ministry of Home. Only recently it was reorganized and it is put at the ages reorganized as a regional planning board and it is under the planning commission. But for a long period there was no policy. There is no, there is a security perspective and there is no development perspective. The development of the policy, all the economic policies which were evolved for the Northeast India were loosely, loosely, you know, uh, put in the macroeconomic plan. So, this was the problem, but now, in 1990s, this, indeed, there has emerged a development perspective for the first time, to my mind. And development perspective is that Northeast North India should be integrated economically with Southeast Asia and politically with the, with the rest of the country. I think this is a this is a development perspective. But to get based out of this perspective, development perspective, to benefit the region or to, or to, uh, or to develop the region in this perspective, one has to, there are certain preconditions. The two preconditions to my mind, one, that there has to be a unified Northeast Indian economy. What I mean by not unified Northeast North Indian economy is that that all the restrictions put in the movement of goods, service goods, capital movement, and factor movement should be removed. 
Second, there should be common strategy on some of the things. There are certain, there are certain problems which are unique to the Northeast India. And these problems have to be addressed doing research and all that. And for that, there should be common strategy. Because otherwise, if you leave it to the national laboratory, to national institutions to resolve the problem, problems very specific to the region, will take a long time, but it may not come true. So there, could be, there should be a common strategy to find solutions for the problems. There should be also a common strategy for utilizing the resources like water, hydrocarbon, utilization of water, utilization of other resources. There should be a common strategy for developing say tourism in Northeast is very good for tourism. And there should be a common strategy for developing the tourism to the tourism. And similarly, there should there could be because if it, it is a if one state is to do all this, then that is not possible because there's a just very small states. But when all are combined in this poor poor population, and of the developed countries, 78% of the developed countries have population less than poor poor, which means that it becomes a, you know, it becomes poor anti northeast India with poor poor population is, a, is large enough for pursuing many of the development policies on a common platform. Therefore, I believe that unified common market is a very is an important requirement for getting for getting the benefit of the newly articulated development perspective. The to streamline the institutions for optimal use of the resources. Because as I said, in, in the, during the 10, 11 plan, during the 10th plan, we were told, the Secretary of Finance Planning Commission has told, in a, in a meeting of the steering group, that 80,500 crore rupees were invested during the plan period for the development of the Northeast. But despite the fact that this is such a large money, which works out, uh, 4 crore rupees means the 4 crore, 4 crore people and 80,500, if you take 80,000, it comes to 20,000. 20,000 per head, 20,000 crore per head for five years. It's a large amount of money. And then where has the money gone? That is one issue. This is but the point is that it is not reflected in the increase in the per capita income of the region. If you look at the per capita income of Assam and compare with all India average, the gap between the two is widening rather than narrowed down. If you look at the infrastructure, Assam was, I think, 2007, India today ranked Assam as 14 amongst the 20, uh, 15 large states. And uh, 15, 16 large states. And uh, 2008, it was 15 position, it was one, one position, it deteriorated by one position. And the smaller states, among the 10 eight special category states, and the eights, they were all at the bottom in terms of infrastructure. So if such a large scale of money has been invested, what has that? It is not reflected in increasing per capita income. It is not reflected in the increase in the infrastructure. The issue is where has the money gone? I don't have answer to this question. Professor Mez Bezburwa, modern Bezburwa, or Guwahati University has been given project by the Planning Commission as a sequel to the question raised in the steering group meeting. And he is supposed to look into the issue and he should be able to tell us where has this money gone? So the point I am trying to make is that the second requirement, first requirement is unique in, we have if we are to get it, if we are to get the benefit, reap the benefit out of the 
new key emerged development perspective. I believe that is a good development perspective. Then the first requirement is to create a unified common market. And second is to stimulate the institutions. Now, how is there to be a stimulate? Because the best borders should be able to tell us at the end of this research and then stimulate the institutions to make proper use of the resources. Because eventually, public sector has to continue to, has continued to, has to continue its major role in the development of Northeast India for a little longer time. If we take the country as a whole, during the 11 plan, 80% of the investment, plan investment has, has come in the private sector. Only government, public sector investment is only 20%. But for Northeast India, it has to be other way around. Since private investment is not coming through, public investment has to be larger. And the public sector investment by itself does not mean unless they are utilized properly. And for utilization, there has to be uh, strengthening of the institutions that utilize the resources. I think I, this is what I felt about the development perspective of the North East India. I'm sure that in the, in the deliberations that will, that will take place in the next two days, we'll deliver on some of these issues and they will be able to give some useful recommendations. If I'm, I, with these words, I inaugurate that seminar and thank you for your guidance. May I now request the Chief Guest, Sri Das, to address the gathering.